Disco, welcome back to 10% True. This is part four of our um, expo expose. Would it be an expose on the F-15? No, it's not really an expose. I suppose some things are being exposed, aren't they? But it's a, a, an in-depth discussion and um, uh, characterization of the Eagle um, based on the many years of experience that you have flying the aeroplane. So thanks for coming back and joining us again. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure as always, Steve, to be with you. You know how much I enjoy talking about this thing. I think everybody so far... Well, three episodes in, uh, feedback's been fantastic. Everybody's saying they want more, you know, with the exception of a few Tomcat lovers. Uh, they're they're all saying they want more. So, I might uh, provide the icing on the cake for that particular comment by saying that I was just at the Air Force Academy versus the Naval Academy um, football game. Uh, the Air Force won again for the thirteenth year in a row. So, yeah. <laughs> There's not a lot to criticize there. Let's let's talk about Norway. Let's just jump straight in. When we were talking, okay. I think I think it was episode two. Might have been it might have been the last one. Um, with the way we've cut these, partly my response, well, mostly my responsibility, or well, completely my responsibility because you don't cut them, I cut them. So the way I've cut these uh, means that there's a bit of disjointedness going on. But we're going to go back to two episodes ago. I think where you're talking about some of the shenanigans that you Eagle guys got up to at Bodo um, in Norway. You're also talking about Dechi, but I want to go back to to, to Norway because I know you, why you were there, but the audience won't know why you were there. Um, what was the purpose of your deployment to Bodo? Uh, our uh, purpose of being deployed to, uh, to Bodo, Norway, was uh, to provide the, um, the uh, NATO task force, NATO amphibious task force, with um, air cover, because not because the US Navy and their Tomcats couldn't do the job, but they were busy down at the Gulf of Sidra, uh, challenging Omar Gaddafi's line of death across the, uh, the uh, Gulf of Sidra. So our uh, American carriers that were uh, supposed to be or were scheduled to, to be part of that NATO task force could not, uh, could not participate in the exercise. Uh, as, as a result, the US Air Force uh, deployed our squadron, the 53rd uh, Tigers, from Bitburg to Bodo to provide uh, land-based air cover for the Navy. Um, the, um, the exercise uh, every two years, I believe, back in the 80s and when, in the early 90s when the Cold War was, was uh, existed, our, uh, that exercise, for those of your audience that are aware of World War II history, is actually kind of a repeat of the 1940 Narvik expedition, where the uh, the uh, the Germans needed the iron ore out of Sweden, and it was uh, hauled by rail over to Narvik, Norway, put on ore ships, and then down through mostly uh, Norwegian territorial waters, uh, and then into um, into ports in northern Germany. Uh, the Germans. Um, that was so vital to them that they that they did a preemptive invasion of Norway to to uh, secure that that line of resources uh, and the um, the coalition of the the, uh, the the British and the French launched an expedition to take Norway back uh, uh, from the Germans and to cut that war supply off. Uh, funny old thing. About a month later, German Panzers rolled into France, and suddenly it became a, you know, it became a um, an ancillary front. Uh, but the the whole uh, thing, uh, the whole reasoning for that uh, biannual uh, exercise was to practice doing the same sort of thing, practice uh, in training of securing the northern ports of Norway against a possible Soviet incursion across the, the top of uh, uh, Sweden uh, in an effort to secure the, the, uh, the you know, the uh, Norwegian Sea and the North Cape and all that for Soviet naval deployments. So the Soviet Navy would not be bottled up at Murmansk and Archangel. So, so you know, in the grand strategies, geopolitical scheme of things, that was a, that was a viable threat from the Soviets. And that was NATO's response was to have a, uh, a well-practiced, biannually trained expedition 
to um, to to be prepared for that. Uh, usually, of course, the the fleet's covered by naval air assets. The Royal Navy always had their their carriers there, the Hermes and Invincible, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, that was shortly to go to the Falklands uh, and Sea Harriers, but those are those are short range point defense interceptors. Uh, and the Navy, our Navy, the American Navy, provided Tomcats for the long range uh, protection of, of the task force. And there were actually two task forces. There was the, there was the amphibious task force, then there's the carrier book in World War II we call the covering group. Um, that was the part that was missing from that particular year's uh, exercise. And we, we uh, supplanted them, if you will, and provided F-15 coverage. Uh, the, the way the operations went was that uh, we had uh, two airplanes on alert, on a 15 minute alert, because it was cold up there and we had to get our poopy suits on to fly over the water. Uh, so that, so we were not on the usual NATO five minute alert, we were on 15 minute alert. Get dressed, fire the airplane up, get everything warmed up and then launch. But we had plenty of time because the Norwegian Air Force, Royal Norwegian Air Force, would let us know when the bears and the bisons and the coots uh, would be rounding the North Cape and heading to, you know, downstream, uh, headed for the, the task force. Or And many of them would actually fly pa past the, the task force and uh, go on to Cuba. The, the bear bomber had that kind of legs, that kind of range. So, uh, so we had plenty of time to get ready. And then they would scramble us. Uh, off um, and uh, we would head north over out over the water, do our weapon systems check. We were we were uh, we were armed rather pathetically <laughs> in that we had two AIM seven Fs, the Great White Hope, uh, uh, we called it, because uh, you had to hope that it would actually hit the target, uh, and uh, and nine hundred forty rounds of twenty millimeter, uh, not the full. You know, not the full ordnance load of an F-15 by any means, uh, but enough to do the job against a, a bear bomber flying straight and level in the 20s or whatever. Uh, so anyway, we would launch out, uh, get a vector from Norwegian GCI, uh, and so we're talking we're talking a couple of hundred miles, you know, short of the the, the bombers being able to even uh, see the, uh, the the task force on their air to surface radars. So, so we were well out in, in front, of, and then what we would do is we would intercept them. Um, I always flew what we called a no-lock intercept. Uh, uh, I would go into uh, I would go into velocity search, which is high PRF Doppler only, because I didn't really care how far away they were. I just wanted to find the azimuth, because uh, that far away, all you need to do is go pure pursuit on them. In other words, point your nose at them. And if they drift left, then you turn a little more to the left. If they drift right, you turn a little more to the right. And then you can get close enough to where you can go to MRM search, uh, which is an interleaved high PRF, medium PRF. Uh, and you can narrow the bar scan in terms of elevation. Uh, and and you, so, so even without locking them up, uh, we could figure out where they were and what altitude they were at. Uh, the reason we did not want to lock on is because the the, the, uh, the uh, Soviet, uh, especially their maritime bombers, had a very enviable um, jamming sweep. Um, it, it, it would take the it would take the the uh, target uh, indicator, if you will, the, the target symbol, and it they could move that around on your radar changing range and azimuth and they could they could write your name on your own radar <laughs> yeah <clears throat> so uh so uh, i never i never locked them up because sure enough they were always they were always at very high altitude we're talking the, usually the 30s and sometimes even in the contrail level you we would spot them dozens of miles away mm. and then it's just a matter of swinging or swinging around the uh the, the, the great curve to, to get in behind them and just don't, just do not fly into the gun's envelope, the tail gun's envelope. So we would stay at least uh, 45 uh, or 60 degrees to the side of the tail and come up on, on the wings from not directly astern, but from the flanks, from the you know, wingtips. And what, 
we'd put uh, 15 on each side. Um, and then uh, if they made any threatening moves, as long as their tail guns, you've seen the pictures of the, the two 20 or 23 millimeter tail guns. If the tail guns were up, then that position was not manned and that was their stowed position, the gun stowed position. So if the tail guns were up, then we had nothing to worry about. Uh, uh, the, uh, but if they were down, of course, we, we were gonna stay, stay well clear. Uh, but I never encountered, never encountered them. Uh, the so anyway, so then we would monitor them. Fly, we we would record uh, on our tape recorders uh, what was called the the door number. Uh, the, the that's the number on the nose wheel gear door, uh, and it's not necessarily the same number as on the tail. And for Intel, uh, I. I guess the Russians would change the tail numbers as a tactical deception means, but they would never change the door number because the maintenance guys had to go, had to know which, which uh, bearer do I need to drive out and replace this part on, right? So it would just confuse the maintenance guys if they changed the door numbers all the time. So, so we had to go, we had to swing underneath and we were given these super cameras with the uh, auto, auto wind feature and we had to take photographs looking straight up at the door for Intel uh, and, 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 and just accompany them until we arrived at the range where, in this case, the Sea Harriers could come out to meet us. And then they would escort the bears across the fleet uh, and, and then let them go to the south. The, uh, there were several interesting, uh, interesting flights uh, doing that. Um, <laughs> There was one time when uh, when we got alongside, and uh, uh, in fact, let me uh, let me get my little training aid here. We 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 got along. We got alongside the uh, trying to see see what you can see. Okay, we we got alongside the uh, the the bear on, on my side. And, and on the top of the bomber, I noticed this circular panel. And then I saw two little troughs extending from it that were obviously, that's where the guns were. That was a, that was a, uh, a uh, retracted turret on the top of the bomber after the cockpit. And I thought, oh, I don't know. I don't think Intel knows anything about this. <laughs> so, so. So taking the camera in one hand, I pulled up and over, upside down, kind of like Maverick does in the movie, and shot pictures of this of this panel uh, out the top of my canopy, and then you know completed the barrel roll to the other side. And uh, my uh, my uh, my squadron commander, we saw those intel photos. He uh, he had a cow. <laughs> he he uh, you know dirtied his pants. And then, of course, I got I got a reprimand for uh, for doing aerobatics around a bear bomber, for doing bear rolls around a bear bomber. Okay, boss, I thought I was I thought I was doing what you guys wanted me to do, you know. So, so, so anyway, that was probably my most adventuresome bear intercept. Otherwise, they were just monotonous, just cruising along. You might as well have been alongside an airliner. Now, there were some other humorous things because the uh, the the bear gunner crews, the rest of the enlisted crews would be in the back with those big oval bubbles that stick out the sides of the empennage uh, underneath the horizontal stabilizer in front of the, uh, before the forward of the uh, gun, tail gun. And there'd be two or three of them with their little leather helmets left over from World War II, you know, and, and, and they, would, they would do things like show us a, show us a, a, a two, liter, two liter bottle of Pepsi. Like, hey, look, we got Pepsi. We got Pepsi here. So my, my wingman, uh, and, uh, his call sign was Scout, uh, uh, he decided that since the Russian uh, news agencies were probably not very forthcoming to the Russian people, the Soviet news agencies were not very forthcoming to the Russian people, that maybe they did not know that Premier Andropov had died. So, so he made this big sign. 
<laughs> in Cyrillic because because he was a Russian linguist as well, and, and and he and he made it. And you know how the back decking of the F-15 canopy uh, has this long, you know, plexiglass uh, uh, teardrop shape. And he put this sign in there, and it said in, in Cyrillic, it said. Andropov is dead. <laughs> Just in case they didn't know. <laughs> so, so you know, we we had some yucks with it. It, it was uh, it, it, with the bears. It wasn't very serious because they're they're you know so easy to to um, intercept. The the badgers are our, our squadron has some uh, a lot more difficulty with the maritime aviation badgers because those guys. Much more maneuverable. You know, it's a, it's a big airplane, twin engine, um, and it has a, uh, a, a cannon uh, in the nose that's uh, uh, used by the pilot. They thought for strafing, I guess, but uh, but it, um, at least the ones that we were worried about did. But the uh, but those guys, if there was a, a a deck of clouds below, then they would try to take us down through the deck and scrape them, scrape our guys off on the water. And that was some very exciting uh, for for the guys flying that mission. That was those were some very exciting flights for them. Um, the, those guys were very aggressive. Uh, the other, the only other airplane that I intercepted was what we call the KGB Coot, and it was an all black Coot, um, and uh, with you know festooned with antennas, top and bottom, and all black, no windows, uh, and it had a little red tail number. Uh, I think zero four was the one that we intercepted, and I and I don't recall it having a door number. Uh, and it, you know, we called it the KGB coot because it was obviously a spy plane. It wasn't operated by the KGB, as far as we knew. You know, we didn't know who who uh, was using it. But obviously, they were out there collecting signals. You know, radar frequencies, PRFs, uh, voice. Uh, they just every every manner of uh, communication or uh, or sensor um, signal data that they could that they could glean out of the out of the air. So anyway, that was my uh, Bodo experience. It was it was a wonderful real world, wonderful in the sense of I learned a lot, and it was not that risky, and we weren't getting shot at, right? Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it was a wonderful uh, real world um, active duty flying experience. Let, let me ask you then about that signals piece and take you right back to the beginning of your narrative on that. Um, you said that you, you did the no lock intercept, you used the velocity search initially, and then the MRM mode. Um, was this Were these in the days that predated Twist, uh, the track while scan mode, where you can, you know, sort of bug a target? That what is the true. Technology is bug a target, and then it doesn't lock that it. That is true. Okay, so it predates that. So, but, so, but not by much. Okay. Not by much. Uh, so that's why I'm kind of hesitant on giving you an answer, but I think that's true. Okay. The thing about the bear was that those four contra-rotating prop discs were a huge radar reflector. They were enormous. And if you got close enough, uh, and this is well after you were within visual range, if you got close enough, you could actually break out all four props. Could you really? You'd have four, you'd have four uh, hits in a, in a little V uh, from the front end of the bomber. Seriously. Wow. They were such a powerful radar reflector. So that's, that's why we could, we could use velocity search. Uh, but, well, velocity search because there was nothing else, else moving out there and anything would show up, right? Mm -hmm. But then we could use MRM search and, and we had no trouble. Usually they flew in pairs, sometimes threes, but usually pairs. Uh, and you could always find the wingman. You could always find him. Right. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, uh, yeah, it, it uh, was right at that time when we were getting twiz. Um, uh, we may have had that RAM assessment mode that you and I had discussed in one of the previous uh, uh, exposés. Uh, uh, so uh, so uh, I, I can't be sure of that. Okay. In any event, we didn't need it. So, so, that's, so, I guess that's what I'm trying to get to, Steve, is we didn't need TWIZ to, to do the, our work against the bombers. I, I, so, so my curiosity is around the, you know, the cat and mouse game of 
signals intelligence, you you having a um, this air to air radar, not wanting to give away all its secrets, not wanting to um, you know to to reveal the signatures to the enemy, them having this jamming suite that can do all this clever stuff, but a, but but it seems that they were prepared to use that because you seem to know exactly what it could do, and and I guess I'm just curious to understand how where where the balance is, who decides whether you can go out and use a particular mode or or whether um you know you want to sort of prompt them to turn on their jammers so that your signal intelligence guys can listen to what right. they're doing and, and all that kind right. of stuff how, how does that does that work at a squadron level is that at a, a magcom level i think so okay I, I think so i mean we we discuss this in our tactics meetings about don't you know don't give give ourselves away um now don't you know none of us were allowed ourselves to fool ourselves if that's uh, how that works in other words we we knew they knew we were coming so to speak right because even the search hits would register on their sensors mm -hmm. so they knew we were out there they and and depending upon the sophistication of their uh, of their computing systems they may be able to try triangulate and, and get an azimuth they should they should have been able to so they knew, but they didn't know the range. Once they, once we locked them up, they could get a range. They could figure out how far we were away from them. Mm. And that's what we were really denying them. We were not denying them the knowledge that we were out there, but how far away were we? Uh, and there's several things that go into that. Uh, the changes in the PRF as range decreases uh, to maintain, you know, to maintain the lock and to prepare the, the uh, the radar to, to support a missile, uh, the signal strength. They knew they knew how you know they knew how powerful our radar was. It's, you know even though <laughs> even though the uh, the uh, the classified dash one would say something like it's nine point six gigahertz plus or minus point three plus or minus point three. That's not a big range, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I think they're gonna. I think they're gonna be able to narrow it down. You don't have to classify that secret. <laughs> so, so they they would know. They could tell by signal strength how far away we were, mm. and of course what PRF we were in all that. So, uh, so it really wasn't. It wasn't a, a matter of just you know, <laughs> surprise. We're on your wing. We knew that wasn't gonna happen. I mean, they wouldn't have that Pepsi bottle ready to show us if they <laughs> if they. Uh, if they uh you know didn't know we were we were arriving so but no it it, it was kind of a kind of a cat and mouse game and, and we were just trying to most of us and anyway, we were trying to play our car our cards close to our chest and and not give away any more about our airplane hmm. uh than than we than we had to to do the job so to answer your question about what level was it decided at yeah it was decided at the squadron level hmm. you know tactics officer our weapons officer not tactics officer our weapons officer, Patchware, he would give us the briefings and stuff, and he would uh, and he would look at tapes, uh, and he would admonish people for, yeah, you're, you know, you really don't don't want to be locking on that far out. It, for a fighter pilot, it gives you a, what we call a warm fuzzy, a very comfortable feeling to know that you got the bad guy locked up, right? But, well, if he's going to take your radar away, and you know and throw it into the Atlantic, then, then you just, yeah, you just ruined your own chances, but it, there is a comfort factor from having a, a lot. And so there were a lot of people who were not that, uh, ambitious about doing no lock intercepts that they, they would rather, um, they, they would rather get a lock and feel comfortable. Okay. This is all going to work out. Right. But, it was, you know, we were the only airplanes out there over the Norwegian Sea. So eventually, then that and big, the big silver bird is going to show up. Eventually, the big silver bird is going to show up. And guess what? We can run him down. Yeah. You know, he's got eight propellers going that prevent him prevent him from exceeding the mock. <laughs> so, so we'll eventually catch him, even if we even if we, we have, even if we get you know stuck way back at six o'clock, we'll eventually run him down. So if you have a a, a mind that, that that says, yeah, th yeah, this is this is not what I would usually do, but it's good for the situation, 
And even if it goes wrong, I have plenty of room to recover, plenty of room. Mm -hmm. Then, okay, I'll do it that way. And, and uh, if they're learning anything about our airplanes, it's not off of me mm -hmm. kind of thing. But yeah, we decided that in the, in, in the squadron. That's true. So, so tell me about this difference then in um, this sort of friendliness or the, the levels of professionalism you might describe it as uh, between the, the different um, adversary aircraft, the bears and, and the badgers and the bisons. And I, I'm, I'm curious because I, I talked to guys who are flying in Syria and have flown in Syria for, for right. you know, a number of years. I think 2016 was when... I think it was 2016 when the Air Force first went there. And and they tell me, you know, there's a difference between the Su-35 crews and the Su-30 crews or the Su-27 crews. They they have different sort of characteristics. So the Su-35 guys are really friendly. The Su-30 guys are not very friendly. Huh. You know, so they'll come up on guard and have a chat if they're Su-35 Su guys. But the Su-30 guys don't do that, and they're aggressive in their intercepts and that kind of stuff. So they're definitely different communities with different personalities in the air. Oh, and, that's interesting. That's, that's very interesting. Yeah, it's curious, isn't it? I, 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 I was sort of amazed to hear that the the thirty five guys would actually come on guard and they'd have a chat. So they they would get information with each other and they'll have a chat to each other. So they they you know they're curious about one another. So so the the question I was going to ask then, um, and and again this week the Pentagon has released um, a video from a B fifty two of a, a People's Liberation Air or Army Air Force. I think it's a J J eleven, so Su twenty seven. Where well, they're copying right. the Su twenty seven intercepting, and they said it was an right. unsafe intercept. And there's this sort of history of these fairly aggressive intercepts happening. Did you have an, uh, a a sort of pre planned approach to how you were going to deal with um, a, a a bison? You know, if if it, if it, you know, so you intercepted bears, you never did a bison, so the the bears were friendly, you didn't have any issues with them, you never got tried to get dragged into the sea under right. undercast. Yeah, very different community. That's true. So, so how how were you going to approach that, and how did the squadron deal with that? I mean, I, is there a temptation to try and get even? Are there sort of dirty tricks, dirty tactics that you no. would play on them? No, no. Victory was was hanging onto their wing, and not and not allowing yourself to get scraped off on the water. You know, if you defeated their tactic, in other words, they were unable to achieve their aim, and and despite everything they would do, the F-15 was right there on their wing tip. Because flying formation off of an air, off any other airplane, it, it, it doesn't change. It, you take the wingtip light that you're looking on the side of the you know, airplane, on the wing of the airplane that you're, you're closest to, and you line it up on something that, that causes you to have a three-point line of sight. For instance, um, we take, if you take the wingtip of, and this could be any airplane, but if you take the wingtip uh, light, the red or green wingtip light uh, of, a, of a badger, and you put it on the curvature of the intake, right? And the head of the intake, of course, is a cockpit. So that's, that's, your, that's your tunnel of vision. That's your line. That's your extended line. And you have, you're out far enough to make sure, and, and it's, easy to, it's easy to figure out, you, you're out. You're, you want to be outside of the wingtip vortices with your wingtip. If you get too close, you'll feel it. You feel you'll feel the bottle. So you scoot out a little bit, but you stay on that line. And no matter what bank the bomber make, you're right there on that wingtip. And and so our guys would just fly that wingtip position off those badgers down through the clouds. And once you're in the clouds, there's no horizon, so you don't know if you're if you're in a bank or not. Um, now, occasional glance at your at your ADI and the calm between the, the two and one on each wing would verify. Okay, we're going down, or you know, we're in, we're in a right turn, blah blah blah, just to have some situational awareness. Uh, and usually, the clouds were about 500 to 1500 feet above the water. So, it, so even the Badger, because it has such a huge turn radius as far as pulling out of any kind of dive, they're going to start pulling out well before they they will get close to the water. Uh, uh, so anyway, so I'm, I mean, I'm not saying it was easy. It's certainly not. It was very challenging, very challenging as for aviation skills, aviator skills. Uh, but it was not something uh, where the F-15 being a, a large airplane was still a very nimble airplane. You know, we could stay with them no matter what maneuver they performed. 
you know, they've got probably what two and a half, three G limit, you know. Um, and let's face it, those guys, bomber and transport pilots are not trained for much more than 25, 30 degrees of bank. Uh, and so anyway, so, so it was well within our capabilities to stay with them and, and we were able to. Uh, the one four ship was led by, uh, by uh, the guy's call sign was Wolf. Uh, and he was our weapons, uh, uh, one of our weapons instructors. And so he led a four ship uh, out against, uh, uh, it was two or three, I think it was three badgers. Uh, so he put, he put the two, two ships on each one of the wingman badgers. And then of course, as they went down into the weather, then they, then the wingman split off, I think is the way the story went. Uh, so now the leader, you know, got away. Okay, fine. You know, the Harriers will take care of him. So anyway, so our guys stayed with the airplane they were on and basically showed them that no matter what you could, what you do, we can still stay with you. We'll be here when we all come out of the weather. Guess what? You're still going to be looking at our smiling faces. So this might be then, uh, you, you talked, um, uh, about the mark limitation of of the bear and being able to outrun it, that this might be a, an interesting point to ask you about other capabilities or technologies that would have helped with those sorts of intercepts, but that never were fitted to the eagle that I'm aware of. So there was never an erst no infrared search and track system fitted to the eagle. Um, wh why is that? Why would that not have been a logical thing to put on the aeroplane? From you know, not only you know, sort of layering your detection capabilities, but also giving you a passive capability. But why do you think there was never anything for the F-15 in that regard? And and how did you feel about it at the time? Did you ever want one? There was, you're right. There was never a real interest in putting an Erst on the Eagle. Um, the, if you want to know how good a, a Tomcat Erst really was, and what they really used it for, you have to talk to a Tomcat driver, or probably more accurately, the Rio, because he was the one who worked the system. Uh, the uh, I I would I don't know this for a fact, but I don't believe that the Earth system had nearly the fidelity of our radar. So uh, why supplement the best? air-to-air -air radar in the world with a subpar infrared search and track system. What would be the advantage in doing that? So, so just, sorry, just to you know, play devil's advocate, you've just described yeah. the the jamming capability um, of, I don't know if oh, it, was, it was the bear or the badger. So your, your radar is now being jammed. You, um, right. I don't know what the scenario is. You now, you, you've got no way of, or maybe you can home in on the jamming source. I don't know. Um, but but, but yeah. how else are you going to target them? Other than visually, <laughs> get me to the visual arena. Let me kick his ass. Other than that, sure. I don't. I just don't know. <laughs> well, let's assume. Let's assume that he's not contrailing. You're in the weather. He's a hundred. Well, I suppose if you're in the weather, your ass isn't going to work, is it? But you know. <laughs> so right. there. Uh, there you go. I proved <laughs> proved my point. But, but my point is, I, I don't believe the fidelity of an Erst is anything comparable to, to the Eagle radar. And yes, you're right. It's susceptible to various jamming techniques and, and we have to work through those. Uh, but, uh, the, so, but I just don't believe the technology, at least in the early 80s, was sufficient to augment the, uh, the APG with a nurse system. I, I just don't believe it was there. Because you would want it to have at least the same capability, right? Now, now, if you were really, because Earth works best when the when the background is cold, right? Naturally, so it's it works best at night, hmm. right? Uh, we we were the premier day fighter, uh, and we were a good night fighter as well. Hmm. But our main mission, because the bad guys were pretty well limited to air to air combat in daylight then then you know that's our primary adversary and we equipped ourselves to deal with that so i'm not sure that erst would have supplemented the uh the the um um f-15s 
sensor suite sufficiently. From a tactical or a training point of view, is now you have to train to use two systems and, and two completely independent systems, hmm. right? And so now you, the, the pilot has to be able to switch back and forth based on which system that person thinks, the pilot thinks would, would be give him the better SA on completing the intercept and getting ordnance in the air. Hmm. Uh, so so, so there's, there's a complication in terms of training uh, and, and even in terms of shooting doctrine. I mean, you saw in our, in our previous uh, episode how fast those targets come down the scope. Two eagles working against two F-4s, and they, and they are marching down the scope. It, it's, it's less than two and a half minutes from fights on to, to the merge. And you, and you want to put in an Erst uh, employment somewhere in, in that two and a half minutes? Uh, you know, so, so you see what I'm saying? It, 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 becomes, uh, it becomes a training problem or a uh, performance ability problem, if you will, in order to getting the pilots up to speed to be able to use both equally. Yeah. I would also tell you, and I'm sure your Tom Kitty friends will, will – uh, cringe at this statement, but usually my experience in looking at uh, threat airplanes, uh, as well as as our own, uh, you know, friendly adversaries, if you will, in other words, the people we're trained against, the airplanes with an Erst used it because it was better than their radar, mm -hmm. not to supplement their radar. You look at the MiG 29's Erst; it's better than its radar. Especially in the search mode, so so that's that is completely different, diametrically opposed, you know, logic um, than ours. Ours is we've got the best. What can help it be better? Well, that can't. I mean, it 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 would be it would augment, but it would never, uh, you know, supplement it to the point where we could easily and quickly go from radar to earth and back and forth to to and because what's the goal the goal is to stay fast shoot first and check six it missiles in the air is is the is the uh, the climactic conclusion of a successful intercept so unless it can get more missiles in the air against you know more targets then it's really just uh extra weight on the airplane Anyway, I, I'm being very judgmental here, and I, no. I shouldn't be because I, I really don't know shit about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you're talking about a particular time frame as well. So we, you know, we, True. You, you said you retired from the Air Force in 2000, and I, I did oh, yeah. have I did have an F-14 guy on the channel, a guy called Park, and he talked about the D model Erst. And so this is, you know, it's different. It's a different time to the one where you're talking about. I think he said to me they could pick out. A tanker and chicks in tow at 190 miles on their Erst. Um, so, so, so I guess you know, and and I suppose sensor fusion nowadays, the increase in computing power, the ability to bring all these things together, that is a oh, different. Very good. That's a different story. Very good. Very good. Um, you got it. You got a tank. You, you got 100 miles between you and and, and the target, right? So, so this is this. And you got. Go and ahead. You go. got four. You got four big old jet engines powering the tanker, and you got another. Four, maybe eight if it's F-15Es or or uh, <clears throat> or uh, not, you know, F-16s. So you have at least four chicks on the tanker, right? So that's at least four more very hot turbofan engines, and the heat signals, especially like on the the uh, turbofans on uh, the KC-10 uh, or the or the uh, KC-135. Uh, Q and, and R models, <clears throat> you, you've got all of these heat sources in very close proximity. So you have at least eight heat sources, maybe 16, right? If, there, if it's two engine fighters that are six and seven. Oh, it's a miniature sun. Anything can see that. <laughs> well, I think the point he was making was that they, ca they could break them out. I don't think it was. It wasn't a block. Good for them. Good for them. <laughs> what are they going to shoot at a hundred miles? So, so this is this was the question that I wanted to ask you um, <laughs> uh, when you, when you uh, um, 
when you were finished with your judgmentalism, uh, if that's even a word. <laughs> so, so, so what? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm no, no, sorry. no, 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 no. This is good. This is good. So, so what would? So what would the benefit of that being? So let's imagine, because they have put an Erst on the, on the C model now. It's got a, I can't remember what it's called, I don't know, Legion pod or something like that. It's called, they carry it on the center line. It's basically stuck in what looks like a, a targeting pod. Um, and I think on the, on the on the Super Hornet, they put one that would, in what looks like a fuel tank. So so they are doing these things. What so, is the, and there, what is the are, advantage? Are they, they must all be looked down then, right? They're, well, all they're under the down. belly. They're under the belly, so they're well, yeah. right, so the tops of the mast. Yeah, so yeah. you know, unless they're flying, <laughs> unless they're flying inverted. Um, so what? Like, you got to be up in the bozo sphere so, to see anything. But 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 is that? I'm now asking you to go out of your lane and to and to hypothesize and and speculate. But is uh, you know my understanding of of how they're operating now is that that's what they're doing. They're flying really high. Um, because, oh, very good. Uh, I mean, yeah. I don't know if that's true. No. I don't know if that's true. But I, and, I, and it, it it would not surprise me that that's true because that's the way it ought to be done. Because they want to lob those AMRAMs. So I think. Oh, absolutely. About, where know. the air is thin. Yeah. So the so AMRAM goes the furthest where the air is thin. So yeah, you want to be very high. You want to be very fast. You want to see things at the longest possible range. That's that's part of that mantra. Hmm. You know, stay fast, shoot first. You want the, you want that huge range. That you get by being high and fast and seeing much further than the bad guys can see you. So, so yeah, I applaud that. So let me ask you then. So not not the Cold War scenario, but just just sort of hypothetically speaking now. So right. so so let's say your eagle can see a fighter sized target at a hundred miles, right, on the radar. Let's say your Erst can can pick up that same target ninety miles further on one hundred and ninety miles. Let's say, what does that ninety miles get you? What does it give you? Is that time? You talk about it marching down the radar scope. So on the timeline of the intercept, is that is that ninety miles of you twiddling your thumbs, waiting for it to appear on the radar so you can do something with it? Are you able to sort of what, what would you expect to be doing with that additional range? I mean, you know, I know you were asking facetiously, what what can I do with it? But what would you do with it? Well, you would position yourself for the intercept. That's it. The the uh, the intercept starts at about forty miles. So that would give you 50 miles to make sure that you are you are moved moving your formation onto the extended expected ground track of the targets. And this is especially important in terms of destroying rays because let's face it, that's what we're really there for. All, all the uh, all the the four v four fighter versus fighter. Uh, that's great for you know the bloody red baron reenactments and that sort of thing. Uh, but but what air to air fighters are really designed to do is to protect targets on the ground that the bad guys want to destroy using air power. So our real our real targets, in all seriousness, is the bomb droppers. It's the people that are gonna gonna destroy our things, so to speak, and kill our people with their bombs. So so that 50 miles, what that would give you. That 50 miles would, would give you the ability to position yourself so that you're in a position at 40 miles to execute an intercept. And as we'll talk about in, uh, in 2v2 and, and 4v4, 40 miles is where the, inter, the actual lethal intercept begins. That, that's that's, that's, the, that's the, the, the window frame that, that the bad guy, you want the bad guys to fly through so that you can kill them inside of that. So, so that's what we would do with that additional 50 miles. And if we could get it with Erst, I'm all for it. In the 1980s, Erst was, did not have the technological advantage that it needed to have to supplement our radar. And that's the, that, that's the no kidding, real, real answer to your question, I think. Uh, and then there's also ancillary reasons that have to do with the, uh, the great military industrial complex of the United States, the prime contractors for our air to air ordinance and our sensors and and getting things changed and the budget pushed through congress to buy the new toys that you know that that these brilliant uh, engineers and scientists had developed for us so 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 that too sometimes it just wasn't worth the fight hmm. if it only added marginal capability we could buy more of something that we knew was was really leading edge technology in the radar uh, regime 
at, at the expense of passing on developing technologies in the IO uh, community, if, if that makes sense. It does, yeah, yeah, it does. Uh, but, so, so there's also that as far as the Air, Air Force as a corporate entity, hmm. what is it going to buy to equip its troops, so to speak, the fighter pilots, with the tools they need to be able to keep bad guys from dropping bombs on our people? Hmm. And, that's, and that's where that's really the bottom line. Let me let me ask you about another what what feels like a glaring omission, and no doubt you will um, come back with another well reasoned argument as you just have around Erst. Um, you know, obviously being playful about it, um, notwithstanding, you know, you, you've you've just given a pretty um, easy to understand answer. High off bore sight capability. Um, so you talked um, an episode or two episodes ago about the fact that you guys were king of the hill until the flanker came along and and. You know the Su um, the MiG twenty nine has the high off bore sight capability during the aim val ace val program in the US in the eighties, which I think was what gave birth to the AMRAM. I think that's what I think that's where the AMRAM came from. Those guys equipped themselves with helmet mounted sights. They sort of put together some some basic capability there. So they were obviously training to that, and they wanted to see the impact of it. But even something like an F twenty two these days. It still doesn't have an, a helmet mounted sight and a high off bore sight capability. The AIM-9X, which is the really sort of super, you know, high off bore sight sidewinder, didn't come along for a long time. Uh, did you feel, having spent a long, long time on this podcast talking about BFM, did you feel that the lack of high off bore sight capability was in any way a hindrance? Was it something that you would would have liked to have seen addressed? Was it? Is it a? I don't want to say a gimmick because clearly it isn't. But is, is it no, it's no gimmick. It's that, no gimmick whatsoever. Is it something that you can sort of easily mitigate by staying out of that mess or the wes that you were talking about? What, 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 give us the story on it. Well, that, and that's difficult to uh, to assess from the 1980s technology. I mean, you know, we're talking 40 years in the past. It's, it's r- rapidly becoming ancient history in a way. Uh, you know, it's like talking about World War II in in the 1985 you know it's it's 40 years in the past uh the what got our attention um in terms of high off bore sight ir missile capability was the magic and the israeli python i think yeah um and so when we trained against the mirage f1 we respected that high off high off bore sight capability very much so and 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 if it looked like they were within uh, 60 degrees uh, angle off of uh, in other words they they could look you know 60 degrees off their nose and shoot a missile the uh, then then we went in, we went into defensive maneuvers because usually we would save that to about 30 degrees in other words the only when the bandit's nose got that much closer would we really go into what we would term last dish maneuvers. The bad news about the Magic, and I think the Python as well, was it, it it would come off the rail of the pursuing fighter, the Mirage F1 or or a Mirage variant that the Israelis had, uh, and it would it would disappear behind your tail, hmm. and then it was it would arc around and it would impact you in the belly. You wouldn't see it come, you know. Uh, and so it's it's you know you see it go through your uh, through your six o'clock, and now what do you do? Do you roll and and try to defend against the missile? And now the the fighters got another shot, right? Or do you continue to defend defending against uh, defend against the fighter that you see and hope the missile loses sight of you? So, so that's that really got our attention. What do you do? Uh, and so, yeah, it would have been nice to have a comparable capability at the time. And and it really, uh, this is this is one where I do lay it at the feet of our military industrial complex. Raytheon was so far down the path with with the AIM nine that the AIM nine X was the best it could do for off bore sight capability, and even is. I understand, and my information is 23 years ago. You know, my last year in the, in the Air Force, so uh, so it's well dated and it's probably obsolete and incorrect. So, and so I allow all of that. So, I uh, wouldn't debate the point. But, but uh, 
but that was the, the, the best Raytheon could do uh, to give us an off -bore, an enhanced off bore site capability. I mean, we already had an off bore site because it was slave to the radar, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but that, that wasn't much. That was within a 10 degree, 15 degree uh, sphere, so to speak. Um, the, uh, the other the missing, the component that we were missing was the helmet mounted site. We, we didn't have that. That was, that was, as far as I knew, a completely untapped, a completely untapped resource uh, or technology, un untapped technology. Uh, and so we had to play catch up with the, the uh, certainly the Israelis, if not the French, uh, to, to, to have something, because the missile itself is no good unless you can point its little eyeball in the direction of the heat source, right? You have to have a means of doing that. And, and there are other means other than having a mount of sight. You can cue the missile to you know, the upper left-hand corner of, the, of, the, uh, of the, the radar scope or the, the HUD or something like that. You can cue the, the seeker head to go to a certain location and then you maneuver the airplane around that point in space to put your adversary's exhaust in that and get the, get the tone, launch the missile. Uh, so, so we were behind on that. There's no doubt about that. We were behind on that. Uh, and I don't know, you know, I'm really glad that we have all that now. Uh, I wish we could have had it earlier, but I don't think uh, we had the contractors because we do buy things from the lowest bidder. You know, you got to remember that. I don't think we had the interest of the contractors up enough to create the system for us at that stage. The, yeah. the technology had to mature enough to where they could offer it to us and say, hey, wow, look at this. This is this will do wonders in a in a fur ball. Yeah, we'll all shoot each other and we'll all go down in flames. So which is you know the towering inferno of Aim Valley Valley. So you said that the um the magic or the Python would come off the rail and come underneath you and then up and hit you in the belly and that caused you consternation did did you have an answer then to did you come up with an answer to how you were going to deal with that threat was i mean is the answer that you just don't get yourself in a position where you get shot like that to begin with is it that simple um or or do you actually did you come up with a choice and and decide that actually if, if that's going to happen <laughs> the, P, the pk is low so you might as well stay with the the, the bad guy and, and hope that you defeat the missile by doing that Ultimately, ultimately, it boils down to just what you said. You, you defend, at least me, my, my way of approaching was defend against the threat I see. Yeah. And hope the other one doesn't get me. But the, the real defense, and this too, was a lag in our procurement of, of uh, defensive systems uh, for the F-15. Because since the F-15 is an offensive fighter, the, the Air Force always funded offensive uh, capabilities over defensive capabilities, right? I mean, that was just a rational decision made in the Pentagon and then went to Congress, get some money, go buy the stuff, right? Very simple. But what I'd have to say is that the the thing that, that uh, I really regret was not so much the lack of a uh, of an enhanced off-board site capability and a helmet-mounted site to use it with, but in his defensive capabilities in terms of chaff and flares. Because mm. I guarantee you, if we had had chaff and flares back in the early 80s, and we were fighting, let's say we were fighting Iraq. You know, they had Mirage F1s. Uh, they might have had Majiks. So, so if we were fighting those guys, and one, and one came off the rail of one of their fighters, I would want to be going, Chaff, flares, chaff, flares, chaff, flares, or just flares, 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 and then have the flares decoy the miss missile while I defeat the guy, the one that's being flown by a pilot. Hmm. So, so if I had if I had chaff and flares, I'd be puking out flares to beat the band while I'm defending myself. So that's the choice, if that helps. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it made me think of uh, something you said to me once about working with the French 
Uh, it must have been the Mirage 2000 guys. Um, uh, is it Orange? I can't remember. I don't know where they're based. They're yeah, probably, they're Orange. Or, or Orange. No, that was the F1. So that was, was the, the F1 F1's? weapon school. I'm, I'm sure you told me that they. It wasn't the Magic. It was the Martra. Is it a five five three? It's the big missile that sits on the yeah. center line. And and you can yeah. you tell the story about that just quickly? It just made me think about. Do Do you remember the story? The I story haven't told of, it on our on your podcast. No. So no. I'm not so, sure what part of that you want to, me to tell. But I'll have to warn your 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 Navy uh, um, uh, fans that this will reflect on the Tomcat as well. <laughs> See, now you're doing it on purpose. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The the, the Navy, the, you know, the F-14, F-15 competition, it, 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 it lives today. I, I'll, I'll get off that little bat, mate. No, I think what you're referring to is that while we were at Orange, uh, each of us F-15 pilots were afforded the, the privilege of riding in the back seat of a 2v1 intercept mission uh, of the you know the French Air Force, uh, training out over the the uh, the Med off Marseille, and then the the Mirage F-1, a huge huge turbo mecha engine with a little bitty little bitty fuselage and cockpit on the front with a radar. And one center line, uh, one center line uh, pylon or uh, station, one center line station, a one, a two, one each under wing fuel tank stations and wing tip missiles, right? So the, uh, the, they had the Matra uh, uh, on, on the belly and, uh, and they, they were clean. In other words, they had no external fuel tanks. So this was purely a quick launch, two two uh, uh, passes, and then RTB is a, a three ship, and they were carrying uh, practice training missiles on on the wingtip, uh, the, the uh, Magic. And so we're in the back seat. We American pilots are in the back seat watching. The uh, they have a rather innovative way of looking through the front seat pilot's cranium. And that is that they had a TV camera mounted on the, uh, on the canopy bow of the front seater and then a TV display above the instrument panel. So what you were getting was the front seater's view out the front of the airplane, which is really great, yeah. really great. Uh, and at the bottom, in fact, it wasn't on the canopy bow. I think it was uh, the same as a gun camera because you could actually get the HUD, uh, and that's 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 probably not the best. They had a they had a very uh, they had an analog HUD display, uh, and it was these wheels with the airspeed and the altitude stamped into them in the heading, and they would rotate based on the inputs from the avionics systems. Uh, so 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 you could tell by looking through the screen which way you're heading, what altitude you're at, and all that. There was no gun sight uh, information at all, but uh, but there was some some radar display, kind of like the MiG twenty nine has a radar display on the HUD. So that, so so obviously there's some, there was some crosstalk between uh, MiG and and, uh, and the uh, Mirage uh, folks uh, as they were developing their technologies in the eighties. So uh, so the so we went up for for two V ones. Uh, Meaning two interceptors and a single target, and and the uh, and the target the, on the first pass, neither one of the F one fighters saw the target on radar. He went poof, right between us. Wow! Well, you know, out of the three pilots in the airplane, I was the only one that saw him, and it was as he was passing off my left shoulder. You know, <laughs> so so okay, we missed intercept on the first pass. Second one, uh, so we come in and uh, and 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 get engaged, and it was a, a big a big swirl, big turning circles, uh, and and call magic kills. And so in the debrief, I go, well, you each had one of these Matra five thirties or whatever it was uh, on your belly. Why didn't you shoot that when you got the radar lock? And and their answer was, it's only good against bombers. Oh. So you would you would you know not shoot it and bring it back to base, you know, all that weight. 
which cuts down on your maneuverability. You wouldn't just jettison it. Uh, no, no, we, you know, we would, we would bring it back to base. So I, I thought that was strange. I, I think that may be what you're referring to. I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah, it, it was. It was so it slightly. It was a slightly different, not a different version of that, but there was some added detail because I think you'd said to them, "Shoot it. It oh, doesn't yeah. matter if it's if it's targeted or not. Shoot it." That's right. I did. I did. I said, "Shoot it, even even if the, it's a big smoke trail that comes off the airplane and dives into the water. It's going to scare them." Hmm. You're exactly right. I did say that. Yeah. yeah. It, it, and get it off and get it off your airplane. If you're gonna maneuver with somebody, you don't want to be lugging around a five hundred pound blivet uh trying to trying to shoot somebody. Anyway, so t t but yeah, that's true. They they were they they I guess they were very cost conscious, yeah. those Frenchmen. Well <laughs> they wouldn't bring that, it back to base. That wine ration every lunchtime is expensive. <laughs> you, you oh, that was good too. That was Don't good too. That. Having wine with lunch at Orange, that was, that was good. <laughs> T tell us, Disco, about something that that did temporarily make a um, an appearance on Eagle then in the form of Eagle Eye. We we, we talked a little bit about pick, detecting targets, erst, um, you know, sort of radar performance, no lock intercepts, all that kind of stuff. Where did Eagle Eye, which I think that was early nine, was that late late eighties, early nineties? It was well, no, I would say it was uh, late seventies, early eighties. Oh, once, okay. once we um, had any uh, uh, EID capability, the ability to to discern um, our targets, you know, good guys or bad guys, then uh, then then you know, we we actually we auctioned them off as rifle scopes to our local hunters. So, <laughs> made a little money for the squadron fund. You know that. <laughs> Here's some beer money. <laughs> what happened to all these equalized? <laughs> they were, <laughs> you know, they were going to go to government surplus anyway. So, yeah. because because it, it, its longevity in the inventory of the United States Air Force was was dated on our ability to determine what we were looking at on the radar by electronic means yeah. good guy bad guy it's friendly or bandit uh so so the, to go back to vietnam the biggest problem with the air force's use of the f4 and the aim 7e was the inability to determine friend or foe over in the skies over north vietnam but by the time um the the F-4s got into range against very small targets. We're talking MiG-21. That thing is just a little needle of an airplane pointed at you. Uh, and the MiG-17, not much bigger. 19 slightly bigger, but those weren't that prevalent anyway. But so, so by the time you arrived nose to nose, beak to beak, uh, in, in visual range of a MiG-21 and could tell it was a MiG-21, and, and of course, in all honesty, what you really had to do was be able to tell it wasn't an F-105 mm -hmm. or it wasn't a Navy F-8 Crusader or it wasn't a Navy F-4. Uh, you could always you could always tell if it was an F-4 at long range because it smoked so much if it was in military power. Right. So but anyway, so 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 if you could see the airplane, see the target and it wasn't one of ours, then then you could declare bandit, bandit, box one and get a missile in the air. But unfortunately, those ranges were so close to minimum range for the missile. We called it break X because there was an X that would show up on the radar scope denying you the uh, opportunity to fire. Uh, is that now you are locked into a visual dogfight with a highly maneuverable airplane and, and you're, you're flying this freight van of a truck, this big lorry of an airplane, uh, trying to get around and, and use your energy superiority to get around to his six o'clock and maybe prevent him from going from running away. But if they went downhill, and even if you an F-4 got behind him with a pulse-only radar, the, it was overwhelmed with ground clutter. And so you couldn't get an AIM-7 to, to do a tail chase to a kill anyway. 
So, so it was very, very problematic. The, the, the technology set up for the, our guys flying F-4s and, and they did the best they could with what they had, but they were limited uh, by the ROE requiring visual identification and not having the means to do so at a range to employ the weapons, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. The Eagle Eye, well, the F-15 had the same problem when it was being developed uh, because, again, our adversaries were, were small. In training, they were the F-5s, not much bigger than a, than a MiG-21 in terms of its visual cross-section. So, so to be able to identify the target as an adversary or not as a friendly, you had to have some sort of enhanced capability. That's what brought about Tizio for the F-4, the TV system. That was all about slaving a TV camera to the radar line of sight and, and producing an image on the, on the WISO's screen in the back seat, and the WISO could announce that it's a MiG-21, shoot, shoot, you know, to the, to the, to the nose gunner. Um, so, so that was the F-15's solution to the problem was, well, let's put a rifle scope, a nine power rifle scope uh, used for hunting, mount it to the HUD, align it with the airplane central reference point on the HUD, in other words, where the nose is pointing. And then once you've got a radar lock, the target, of course, is in the, the target designator box, a little square uh, uh, container. And you put that over the airplane reference point, and then you would lean forward, put your eye to the scope, hope nobody moved, and see what was there. <laughs> Well, guess what? You got two. You got two moving parts to this problem. One is the bad guy. If you know, he's not going to fly straight at your your eyeball, right? No, he's going to be going one way or the other, right? And plus, your airplane. So it was, and it's just human nature. It's just you know, uh, muscle memory and all that. If a if a person is holding a stick and flying an airplane, and they lean forward they tend to pull the stick back. And so you wind up raising the nose of the eagle and there's nobody home. You look through the, you look, you look through the eagle and there's nobody there. And, and then if you want to fly around, you know, <laughs> you know, like you're, like you're, uh, you know, making buttermilk in an old churn, if you want to fly around with your eyeball on a, on a, on the back end of a, of a rifle scope while the, while the target is getting closer and closer and closer and closer, you know, all these seconds, then you probably ought to get another line of business, you know, <laughs> because that, that's not, that's not a good way of, of entering a fight is with your eyeball pressed to a, to a rifle scope and the bad guy swarming in behind you. Uh, so, uh, so, so it was, yeah, that was a good idea. And it, and it was very effective for against bombers against, for instance, when we launched off of alert at Bitburg to uh, investigate, that was one of the categories of intercepts, investigate this target. Well, you could do that. In other words, if you were investigating a, a, uh, a light airplane, a Cessna or something, uh, or a, uh, let's say a Swiss, uh, Swiss biz jet happened into the NATO air defense identification zone without a clearance, you know, he's, he's flying straight and level, you know, for those kind of targets, sure. You put the, the Eagle eye on them and go, yeah, that was a Cessna 172, blah, blah, blah. Or that's a, that's a, um, you know, Pilatus, uh, whatever. But so those are routine, very low demand situations, fighter versus fighter. The only advantage was, was, <laughs> If you were a red flag or fighting the aggressors in any way, and you went out there, and as soon as five saw them, you saw them marching down the scope, you took your radar lock, and you got, you you kind of lean forward into the scope and go, well, I tried. <laughs> bandit, bandit, <laughs> box one. <laughs> and when and when the aggressor flight flight the uh, leader, flight commander, you know, question, did you, did you have a proper VID? Oh, yeah, I had my eagle eye. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So so it was good for getting an early kill, eliminating one of the F fives out of the fight, and going two v three against the remainder. You know that was a, that was its only use. You know, it was like throwing it down on the poker table at Vegas and say, "I raise you one one rifle scope." It's interesting. It's interesting to think about the journey the Eagle went on. We talked about this, I think, in the first episode about you know the the F fifteen didn't enter service in seventy four. You know, I think it was seventy four with sort of you know the complete uh, package, the complete sort of set of sensors and capabilities that those things came. Oh with. no, I, I'd forgotten that you didn't have chaff and flare. I mean, just oh, the, no. the idea you were flying around without that is quite crazy in my oh, mind. Oh, that yeah, that uh, I thought that was almost criminal. Yeah, you, you, by, by the by the mid eighties to to send up you know our uh, squadrons at Bitburg and Schusterberg in potentially into battle with no means of self defense. Hmm. I, I've I view that as criminal. Did you have Did you have the jammer at that time? So the LQ one thirty five, you know, it's sort of the the boxes sit behind you in the in the cockpit. True. There was yeah. that installed True. at that time. True. Did it work? Did, did you Did you have confidence in it? It worked well, as far as I know. You know, we we never, thankfully, we never had to to test it. You know, in actual conditions, uh, but it worked well against SAMs. Mm -hmm. uh, it had lim limited capabilities against AI radars. Is that not a bit backwards? Would you not expect, uh, given the job of the Eagle, to do the other uh, way well, around? Well, actually, in a sense, you 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 have a point. That's true. Uh, but if you view the F-15's role, visually, we were defensive. We were expected to be defensive in our lanes, you know, you know shoulder to shoulder with the FGR-2s out of Building Wrath and, and, uh, and others. We, uh, so, so we were defensive. But there would quickly come a time after we absorbed the first attack, because we expected them to attack first, of course, there would... There would quickly become a time when we would be doing just like we had to do in Iraq. We had to do in North Vietnam. We expected to have to go downtown to their side and basically kick the shit out of them, you know, bomb their air bases, bomb their munitions storage, bomb their, interdict their, their, their train lines that were bringing ammunition and reinforcements to the front, you know, whatever the, the NATO uh, overall commanders, ground commanders, one and we had to be able to do that so we we had to be able to penetrate their air defenses establish a i won't say a sterile or a you know a bandit free environment but do our best to protect the our bomb droppers f4s largely uh nato f16s and then uh, rf 16s you know uh, followed up right away so we had to be able to establish and a sense of air superiority, local air superiority for that operation. And, and that involves, uh, you know, neutralizing their SAMs because their air defense network was highly SAM orientated. Uh, and so we had to get through that SAM belt and, and suppress the local uh, radars, SAM radars, uh, just, I don't know, because you know the weasels that we we generally would plan on going in with weasels, and we can get into this kind of discussion when we talk about air campaign plan. But generally, it would be one four ship of weasels, two four ships of eagles would be the the uh, the, the the guys out ahead of the package. Uh, you know, one four ship to take each flank, the weasels up the middle, and the weasel would be doing lethal suppression. Uh, the, their IADs, uh, and and we needed to be impervious to that. In other words, we need to be not distracted by the SAMs because we had a job to do air to air. If that makes sense, yeah. It's kind of a layering of almost mentalities as well as capabilities. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah it does. You know, we we could not, we couldn't be bothered, if you will, by the SAMs unless unless you knew one was targeting you mm -hmm. and there was a missile in the air. Then, of course, you got serious about survival. But otherwise, we just let the jammers do the work, suppress suppress these radars, uh, jam them, uh, uh, doing whatever, you know, whatever the power relationship would, 
would provide. I mean, our output power versus their transmitting power and all, all that dynamic. Uh, so, so in a sense, given the, the, the mission of the F-15, remember it comes out of Vietnam, we had to be able to go into their backyard and do our job. Uh, it wasn't a, a purely defensive air-to-air -air role. Mm. It was air-to-air, -air, but it was air-to-air -air on in their airspace. So to, to do that, we had to deny them the ability to shoot us down with their SAMs as much as the technology would permit. So, so Disco, in I think it was episode one, you said something that I thought was quite interesting that I haven't followed up with you on, and, and maybe now's a good time to do that. You said that um, when you were talking about the dominance of the F-15 uh, at the top of the hierarchy of all the fighters in the Air Force inventory and, and friendly Air Force and foreign Air Force inventories, you know, it was at the top. And you said that all, you didn't say it changed, but you said it, you said the arrival of AMRAM was a leveler. I think that's what you said. We're four episodes in, and this was episode one, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So it's, it's sort of six hours of conversation to go. But I'm pretty sure you said it was a leveler. Um, one of the things that is commented on, let's say, by people when they're observing the Eagle community is the fact that they are, they, 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 have, they have the appearance of being, and perhaps you'll tell us whether or not this is correct or not, of being a little siloed. Um, not necessarily, well, maybe even being a little aloof, perhaps. Um, you know, they're doing their they're own both, thing. Yeah. Um, both, of, both of those are, um, both of those are accurate um, comments um, on the F-15 community. Yeah. So, so can you tell us then a little bit about why those, th those things are true? Um, and what impact, if any, well, it did. So what the impact was then of the arrival of AMRAM amongst the other tactical Air Force fighters, the F-16, the F-18, F-15E, uh, and so on? How, how did that change? Was that threatening to the Eagle community in terms of your superiority? No. What, did, what did it mean? Uh, what it meant was that, that, that yeah, the, the AMRAM was definitely the great equalizer as far as air to air combat BVR uh, modes. Uh, so, uh, so whereas before with the AIM-7, the, the, the F and the, and the M, uh, no one else carried those, those weapons. No one else had any reason to know anything about them. Uh, and I think because uh, part, part of uh, Part of the aloofness, if you will, if I can address that that point, and, and it's very accurate. Uh, the F, there's a reason. <laughs> there's a reason why the F-15 Eagle was referred to as the Ego Jet by other uh, fighter communities, it's principally the F-4, but any anybody else who flew uh, in that environment. Uh, yeah. It, it was ego jet drivers, you know, uh, uh, and, uh, and 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 they would have disparaging comments about it was the size of a tennis court, you know, and, and other things. But hey, it did the job, and it did the job because of the way it was designed. It was designed to do that job, and it did it very well. But but there, when I I was really, I got to say, I was really shocked. I've, I've been uh, a uh, uh, a pilot training, a jet pilot training instructor for for four years, and and when I went to the F-15, uh, there were no F-15s available when I graduated pilot training, uh, and I and I didn't really, well, I, I wanted an F-15, there wasn't any, so I, I stayed on as a, you know, a T-38 instructor. Um, I think we might have covered that a little bit, but. Uh, but when I finally got to the F-15, I was really appalled, and that's probably too strong a word. I was surprised. I was surprised, you know, because all the training at first, of course, is similar. You know, it's one v one against your instructor. They they give you two rides or so, and then and then uh, the uh, your instructor pats you on the ass and sends you out to a jet to fly solo. You know, so so it's like woohoo! But man, big intimidating airplane. Uh, so and and of course solo in any airplane. I know as an instructor, solo in any airplane is a confidence builder. It tells you as an individual, I can fly this machine. And then you can you you know you mount up, you saddle up, strap in, and you go fly it. Uh, but then after that, all of the training is one against one 
basic fighter maneuvers, and then two against one, uh, 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 which are, uh, uh, we call it ACM, right? Uh, air combat maneuvers. In other words, uh, who's the engaged fighter? Who's the free fighter? Where's the target? Uh, sw you know, switching roles to get the kill. Uh, and that was all summer with, against an F-15 that would play target for us. Uh, but then when we got to two against two, and we'll get into, into the actual tactics later, that was always December. And this then I'm, I'm taking a long time to get to my point, and I apologize for that. Mm. Uh, but of course, our adversaries were always F-4s. Uh, there were F-4s from the Gar, there were F-4s at other bases like Georgia Air Force Base. I was at Luke, Georgia Air Force Base had, had uh, F-4s, weasels primarily. And, and it really surprised me how dominating in both the briefing and the debriefing that, that my flight leader was. Um, and, and it's a part of my fighter pilot vernacular, but basically the tone of the briefing is, was thank you for showing up. We're gonna rip off your heads and shit down your necks. Oh, whoa. <laughs> They, they were intimidating. They intended to be intimidating. They intended to be arrogant and, and, and just show that they were superior with the, with the very first words after the time hack in the briefing. You know, it, it wasn't, let's take a look at our tapes and see who, how we did <laughs> at the end. It was, yeah, we kicked your ass, you SOBs. And, and, and I, I just was amazed. I was in wonderment of it. That's the attitude. That's the fighter pilot attitude. And yes, uh, it was extreme, and maybe it was extreme to impress me and the other the other students that that as as a single seat fighter pilot, you had to be you had to be um, ultimately, I guess is the right word, you had to be completely confident of your abilities to kill the other guy. You you could not have any shadow of a doubt that you could go out there and you could kick his ass. And so it's part of the the mentality that became the mystique, that became the you know the derided uh, uh, attribute of being an ego jet pilot. Uh, so so while it might have been well meaning, it was overdone. By, by yards and miles, and in fact, I, you might uh, recall uh, when we were putting together the 15 Eagle engaged. There's that part about how the first fighter wing was was an F4 RTU unit based in McDill, and when TAC Tactical Air Command stood up the F15 unit at Langley, then the guys there. Uh, that were forming the new first fighter wing flew their F-15s down to McDill, took all of the first fighter wing historical memorabilia. They basically raped the place, took all their flags, all of their war trophies from Vietnam, everything, and hauled it back. And then, you know, the next day, the, uh, the F-4 guys and, you know, front seaters, back seaters, instructors, you know, they were, they were, they were told they were now what? 400 and something, something of uh, tactical fighter wing, you know, it, it, they just, so, so, so that whole thing was in my opinion, overdone, maybe for a good reason, because now instead of having a two person airplane, uh, the air force had to count on a single individual in an airplane that it paid a huge amount of money for doing the job and doing it right and and uh, in, enforcing air superiority over the enemy. So anyway, so yeah, the, the thing that you mentioned about, uh, about being arrogant, that was a well-deserved uh, and uh, that was a well-deserved reputation that I'm not particularly proud of, as you can probably tell from the way I, I voice all this. Uh, yeah, I, I do like to think that we were better than any other air-to-air -air fighter outfit. And if we're going to be better than any other air-to-air -air fighter outfit, we have to believe that we are. 
better than any other fighter out there. I mean, so it's one of those uh, one of those self fulfilling promises, or in the Air Force we call it a self licking ice cream cone. If if you're following, you know. Yeah. So yeah. so anyway, then uh, so so that that led to the aloofness that you mentioned. We're superior. We're better than everybody else. Well, we were and we weren't. We were because we flew the airplane we flew and because we trained to its specific capabilities, very small, very small in the spectrum of combat, air-to-air -air air superiority, air-to-air -air combat is a very small segment of that whole spectrum. The F-4 guys, F-15E guys, F-16 guys, they had a broad spectrum. They had to be good at many things. And, air, and defending themselves, flying air to air combat was one of them, oh, by the way. So you can see how the, this niche uh, led to a, a sense of superiority and an arrogance that, that uh, was, at, on the one hand, self-serving, but on the other hand, it was self-defeating because you did not have the respect that you thought you were gathering because you were such an asshole mm -hmm. about how you did it. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It's an interesting that's, anyway, that's my perception. That's yeah. my perception. It's well, I, I wondered how that also was internalized then within the Eagle community. There are, you know, sort of various um mantras you hear, or well, well, it's not a mantra, maybe it's an observation, but the Eagle Eagle drivers eat their young, or the Eagle community eats its young is one of the things that I've heard. And uh, I don't you know, know what that means. I, I think it means, from my understanding of what it means, is that, you know, you've got young lieutenants coming into the squadron, you know, if they mess up, no one's going to sort of wrap them up in cotton wool and tell them it's okay, we'll try again harder next, next on the next sortie, you know, it, it means that they get, you know, they're going to get, um, I don't know, what, what, what happens in the, the debriefing room, I mean, you, you've talked in the past about, right. there's no there's no rank there, you leave your ego at the door. That's right. I've I've heard about three hour long debriefs. I don't know if that's the same for other communities these days, or if it was in those days. But yeah. I, you know, I don't I don't know what happens in 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 those debriefing rooms. Yeah, but I think you might be talking about uh, the the post eagle assignment assignments, where the 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 at least in the eighties on the front lines, and by front lines I mean Bitburg, Schusterberg, Kadena. Okay, Kadena, anything I say about Bitburg and Schusterberg in terms of uh, uh, our uh, capability and preparation for doing the job applies equally to Kadena because mm -hmm. they they had this, the, the same sort of thing, just a different, they had the same sort of threat, the same sort of challenge in front of them, just a different theater. Right. So so uh, I don't ever mean to to uh, to uh, make the 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 Kadena guys uh, second fiddle to the to the European Eagle guys. We were all doing the same job, just different parts of the world, just different sides of the world. Uh, so. Uh, so when so so the all of the pilots assigned to those units uh, and maybe even Anchorage when you include it. Uh, with F-15s, uh, but those three primarily, and 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 of course Lake and Heath when it be became an Eagle uh, community uh, after the 111. But but those communities, the the pilots coming into those communities were the very best. There's no doubt in my mind. I, I served with the very best uh, pilots in the Air Force because they had been uh, they had been. Uh, selected that's not the right word but but they had they had grown up through the filters of training command right and only the best stick and rudder guys only with and great airmanship great air sense only those guys got fighters uh the uh coming out of other communities uh an f4 guy or a one of f106 uh guy uh they were the very best in their community and so so it was a kind of a refinement um uh, like a pyramid if you will all right so coming percolated up through these various sources of f-15 pilots then uh, it would only be the best of their own community that would reach the f-15 rtu and then 
once once they get got deployed uh, to what I consider a first line unit, front line unit, and that's the ones on the what we call the ramparts of freedom. That's not to that's not to take away from the state side based units, but but that's a the, 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 that's a different segment of the the eagle community, and we can talk about that some other time. But but for the guys on the front lines, that that was that was your career making assignment. If you did well there, then you would go on to bigger and better things. If you did not do well there, and I don't mean just flying skills, uh, the uh, the fighter pilot lifestyle was uh, very demanding. You were away from home a lot. Uh, they there were all kinds of stresses uh, having a family in an overseas community, uh, and you know. Uh, some, some, and, and each of us have to make our own decisions about those those sorts of lifestyle priorities. Uh, so, so if in your assignment, if um, as an F fifteen fighter pilot, you were selected to go to a fighter weapons school, then you were the creme de la creme, right? Because only the cream rose to the top through this pyramid uh, structure that I've described. Only the cream wound up in the F-15, and then the creme de la creme went to weapons school, became a patchwork, came back as a weapons officer, and and uh, and, and, did, and those guys were all great. Those guys were all great. The, the, I can't, and there's not a single one of them uh, that, I, that I wouldn't buy a drink for today. You know, just tremendous people all around. But if a person was at the other end of the, of the, uh, social stratus within the F-15 community, then they'd find themselves going to some other airplane, uh, a slow mover, or maybe a, maybe a, 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 a FAC, ALO, you know, uh, you know, and, and, and granted, those were needed too. And some people made the decision to do that voluntarily. Hmm. Uh, for various reasons, again, you know, lifestyle decisions, uh, you and your your wife and your family and all that. Uh, so I'm not saying that they were not good, but there was there was a cost. Um, for instance, I probably told you about Ghost, right? Did I tell you about Ghost? Tell me Ghost again. was a guy we had in the squadron who would come in. I don't remember him having very many additional duties. So whatever he did, he did very little of it. He would fly his sorties. Uh, and then he would write up debrief. He'd leave, and go home. He uh, was a fape like me. Uh, and guess what? He went back to flying T thirty sevens because mm -hmm. even though he had been a great T thirty seven instructor, he wasn't fighter pilot material. So that's what I'm talking about as far as the uh, the segregation or uh, stratification of the F fifteen community. To where, where if, if you did well, then you got to stay in it, in a way. I mean, we all went, we all went to other jobs eventually. Uh, very, there were very few uh, F-15 back-to-back assignments. I went to AT-38s, taught fighter lead in, and then went back to the Eagle, you know, as a squadron commander. So, so, uh, so I was probably I was probably not all that high on on the overall, you know roster of eagle drivers but i was high enough to stay in it or get back into it uh you know two like you know two assignments in a row after that so but there were guys who lost their chance um because they they just and it's all it's all very subjective hmm. it's your squadron commander your operations officer your flight commander your your squadron weapons officer they're all making these inputs on where what the rack and stack is uh so so um i'm not sure that I'm not sure that that answers the question that you ask anymore uh but anyway so but it is to say that yes we were aloof uh and we were siloed as you said uh and uh and 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 you and, and the air force was uh was was bad about siloing everybody 
if you were if you were a strategic guy, you flew B fifty twos, turn into B ones. Hmm. If you were a transport guy, you flew one forty ones, turn into C seventeens. So we were all siloed. But even within the fighter community, yes, there was the F fifteen and the F sixteen. Uh, the uh, the AMRAM, I think, is really what you asked about. After all, I apologize. Uh, was the great equalizer. So, uh, so, so the, uh, the, the, what, what happened with the AMRAM in terms of flying against one another, I've already described the, the situation with the F4s, right? That, that early on, we wanted to make sure that they knew, you know, that they, that, that, that they were not very good relative to us, right? Because it, it, it enhanced our self image. Uh, uh, but when the F-16 came on board and was a great maneuvering airplane, excellent dogfighter, uh, and then it got the AMRAM. So now it could shoot as far as we could, even if it couldn't see as far as we could. <laughs> right. Uh, and so then we began to, to start to share a little bit. And what we had to do was was if the F-16 adversary, look, let's say the Han F-16s, for instance, if they were going to simulate fulcrums, then we would put limitations on the ranges that they could shoot a Fox-1 to simulate an archer, to simulate a Soviet missile. Uh, so we could get, because part of the mantra is, stay fast, shoot first, check six. So... So we wanted to be able to shoot first because that's how we do our job. So even though their missile could reach us and our missile could reach them in training, we wouldn't want that because there's no training there. You're, everybody's dying. You know, there's fireballs all around the, the arena. Uh, so uh, so if, we, if it's for our training, then we limit, limit their range. If it's for their training, if we're uh, simulating flankers, for instance, then then we would impose uh, weapons employment limitations on, on our Fox ones to give them an opportunity to employ the AMRAM against us. But again, it's with one of us, one side or the other, simulating the Soviets. So, so because of that, yeah, we had to be more open about the AMRAM and its capabilities and what it could do. Because we were the experts. We were the air-to-air -air experts. They carried AMRAMs, and even the F-15E, uh, community they carried air rams for self-defense in other words if, if a bad guy showed up on the radar scope and the air to air the light grays hadn't taken care of the problem then they were to lock them up and shoot them uh, and, and send the air, air ram on its way stay on your stay on your uh your course get to the target drop your bombs and come home uh, so uh so that's why they got the missile uh, and not that we regretted that. that. That was great. The more, you know, the more firepower, the better, you know? Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, so, I'm probably, I'm probably the man rambling now and not really answering your question. No, 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 no. And, and the answer is the answer, but whatever you give is the answer. So, um, and you know, that's, that's, <laughs> that's nothing to apologize for. It's great. So, I suppose one of the the questions I have around this then is obviously is you know has some sensitivity to it, and I, I'm not I don't want to put you on the spot. And the the name of the game here isn't isn't to try and make you feel uncomfortable, but um, you know I talked to oh, I talked to various. Don't worry, if, don't worry. If you do, I'll just lift my screen. And go, I'm out of here. I I talked to I talked to people about AMRAM employment, obviously at a at a very basic level. Um and, and one of the things I've heard is that, you know, there are people that have wanted to go to the you know, so I talked to a guy who was at Lake Anith and he said I wanted to go we never went to the C model guys. Never went to the C model guys at Lake Anith, so this was an E model guy and I asked them and then when we did they said that, that, that they couldn't help us because we weren't allowed to see their tapes. Um, so there are obviously some sensitivities around some maybe some things that you could do with the C model that you couldn't do with the E model, but but I wondered, in terms of um, you you talk about the machi the machismo the the sort of the chess beating the yeah. the ego, yeah. um, notwithstanding those classification issues, was there reticence 
or reluctance to share? I mean, did you do a brain dump when the F-16 guys came along and said, we've got AMRAM? Did you just say, here's all the stuff that we can give you? No. Now, we, we, know, that, we know that they received their information from the same source we did, primarily the 422. The, you know, we, the, the, strictly, uh, because we had an air-to-air -air radar set up, uh, there, there were capabilities that the light grays had in terms of radar operation that the dark grays did not. And it has everything to do with the offensive uh, air to air employment, air superiority role, or yeah, air superiority role versus protecting, you know, force protection, so, uh, you know, defending yourself against the enemy. And so, so because their radars had to be had to be able to do so many other things to to employ air to ground ordnance, uh, you know, as well as all the EO uh, electro optical optical uh, uh, technologies and stuff. So, so th their channel of information was from Navas, just like ours was. And if and if ours was classified, and and they had no need to know, and we would know if they did. You know, because there were need to know lists, of who who we could talk, who who we could share with, and who we couldn't. Then I'm sorry. Yeah, you're carrying the same same uh, uh, ordinance. You have a similar radar. It's not the same radar, but you have a similar radar. But I can't I can't talk about that. Hmm. Yep. It's like um, what's that um, meat love song about? Um, I'll do anything for love. But I won't do that. <laughs> so, so anyway, so no, the there was no reticence in terms of uh, feeling arrogant or superior, uh, because by the because now you're talking about the '90s versus the '80s, really. This transition came again with AMRAM, which uh, was late '80s, early '90s technology. So that that was when the transition was made. So anything. At that stage, I think uh, I think it, the eagle community had had matured, and I mean, I mean, I mean, in the sense of growing up. I think the eagle community had grown up. The you know the initial cadre were all F four guys, many of which had flown in Vietnam. So so you know so so that's that's the starting point of the F fifteen eagle eagle jet eagle driver uh, attitude. And but it had to as those uh, those pilots uh, matured out of the system and became you know they went to the Pentagon or they went to TAC headquarters they came back as wing commanders uh, as they matured out the top they they lost uh, the the bulk of their influence over the rest of us if that makes sense mm. and, and then as the rest of us you know kind of you know that really wasn't very good the way to do things and we kind of changed you know and adapted uh we realized that that you know for instance we're all in this together if we're all in this together let's let's cooperate and graduate you know not uh not not you know be fighting one another just for uh just for uh for bragging points when the bad guy is the ones we have to be able to defeat so, so there, there was a certain maturity that took place, especially when the F-16 came along and was a true challenge to the F-15 in terms of just this maneuverability. And challenge, I mean, in, you know, 1v1 combat uh, or training. Uh, when the F-16 came along, it's was like, okay, yeah, that's a respectable performance, especially every time you arrived on your six o'clock. You know? <laughs> so, so, you know, so we got, we got the... Uh, we got uh, toned down a little bit, uh, taught a few BFM lessons, and uh, and we're, we were no longer completely the king of the hill. We could get there because of, of other aspects of the airplane, but, but uh, it's just a, you know, just a all no all fangs in the floor, you know, you know hair on fire, you know, furball. That was no longer the way to go. Yeah. You, you could do that with. With against F fours, against uh, floggers, against Mirage F ones, you, you couldn't do that against a Viper. Yeah, you're you're just setting yourself up to be in his gun camera film. 
So, so yeah, it matured. It matured to where it was a more uh, collegial, I would call it, yeah, uh, relationship with other units, limited only by again the strictures of the, the security requirements, not that's... not by attitude, because I think that's the basis of your question: was it attitude or was it uh, you know required? Yeah, I think it's. I think the question is both things. I think it's, um, you know, w were you unable to, and were you unwilling? And obviously, there were things you were unable to do, other things that you were willing to do. But it does does make me wonder, just briefly. Um, you know, when when oh, you, you know, I can't do that. <laughs> I can't either. I can't, I can't ask a brief right. question. <laughs> um, as briefly as I can. Uh, yeah. I, I've known you for a long time. You, 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 you're somebody who has lots, in my view at least, lots of integrity. Just a really sort of stand-up guy. Um, uh, when you're talking about that sort of uh, briefing, debriefing thing, when you were going through the the RTU, or when you were a young guy in the Eagle, and that was your flight commander, and, and maybe he was doing some of that to impress you or to show you the way and to to instill in you some confidence. I, I can't imagine you being like that. That doesn't sound to me oh, like I could. the sort of thing you could do. Okay. Oh, I could. I, so, I, so I that never was, emulated that. That was going to be my question. Is is no. you know, can can you have two personalities? One is the guy in the flight suit who's in the briefing room and another guy who's out of the briefing room and, and is just back you know with friends or whatever. No. No. No, my uh of course you have to remember that this was an RTU uh in seventy nine eighty. Uh got to Bitburg. I was a wingman for almost a year. Uh, became a flight lead. Uh, we fought regularly, trained regularly with the Spain Dalam F4s, the uh, the uh, Luftwaffe F4Fs, uh, occasionally against the the um, Dylan Rath FGR2s, and I could never be that way. You know, even if I knew we were better than them, and we and we shot them where we should, blah blah blah, uh, and we and we. Def defended ourselves and none of us got shot you know that was a good day right uh but but you and i even saw on that that one video where the two f4s against two f15s at least at least one of those f15s got got shot by an f4 so those those days happened so no i could never be so arrogant because it would be so humiliating to have that attitude and then wind up in somebody's gun camera film you know, it would be. It'd be embarrassing, but because I made such a big deal about being so much better than them, and here they've got gun camera film of me. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I'm just, that's just not me. No, I could not. I, like I said, I, I think I used the word appalled. I think I was mm. appalled at the uh, atmosphere that my flight leader created in that training uh, mission. Okay. I mean, why would why would those guys ever want to fly with us if we were that if we were that way, you know? Yeah, it's appalling. Yeah, let's uh, let's let's change tack a little bit. Um, sure, we're we're sort of tying up some loose ends. I think what we'll do is right. we'll we'll tie up the loose ends. Um, and there's been some questions that come in through the YouTube comments. Um, so we'll we'll tie up those as loose ends, and then we'll. Uh, call it a day for four okay. then we'll come back and do five which will be four v four four v many and then we'll talk about your well we probably and yeah, we probably need to start with the basics of 2v2 didn't we do 2v2 did we did we skip that we did 2v1 you know which is air combat maneuvering okay. against a single bandit okay. uh which after you blow one up you know bvr then that's all you got if it started as 2v2 but anyway now uh, well, i'm glad you're uh, paying that, attention so yeah, that's i fine. would like to go with go through some basics of 2v2 because it's the building block approach. What we talk about in 4v4 assumes an understanding of 2v2. Okay. So we'll start with with 2v2, 4v4, 4vx, and then we'll talk about yeah. um, For the, the defeat. On the next session. Okay. All right. Um, Sounds good to me. Perfect. So um, high altitude performance. So when somebody was listening to the uh, high fast flyer segment, which is you Oops. were talking about intercepting um, MiG-25s and um, uh he had posed the question, which I've never thought to ask, uh, but it's an interesting one, which was, you know, how performant was the Eagle at high altitude? Uh, we've talked in this episode about the fact, I'm pretty sure they're flying high and fast now, you know, to get those 
those AMRAMs out there as, as far out as they can. They're working with fifth gen aircraft who I think are probably going to do the targeting, pass the information, you know, to, to the, um, what effectively is like a, a, a sort of bomb truck, but for AMRAMs, which is going to be the F-15, right. the, the 4.5 gen fighters, yeah. and they'll, they'll right. shoot them out there. So that's, that's probably what they're doing. I'm, I'm speculating that's probably know. what they're doing. Who knows? Yeah. Could be wrong. No. doesn't really matter. This is just a conversation. But anyway, Mark 2.5, you go and read Bill Gunston's book on the F-15, um, you know, or, or the little Jane sort of references that came out in the mid 80s, you know, the design <laughs> specification for the for the, F, the F-15 was Mark 2.5 as an interceptor. How fast did it go? Oh, How it fast? was. Oh, it was. <laughs> okay. Here, here, here's my experience flying the F-15 high and fast. And, and, and I've done a couple, I've done a couple of sorties. Uh, you know, we have what's called the uh, FCF, the functional check flight. Functional check flight. And I did a, a few of those. And we had to get to 2.5 or close. Uh, you know, and of course the airplane was, yeah. You know, the contract with Mac Air was 2.5. It had to achieve that, right? Uh, the fastest I've ever been in an F-15 was 2.25. Mm. Now, granted, that was uh, that was off alert with a single bag and four by four missiles, eight missiles. So yeah, there's some drag there, and I'm, I'm sure if I was clean, it probably would have hit 2.5. Yeah, because extra drag. Uh, but, uh, but if you're talking a fully armed airplane making 2.5, I don't think so, but there's always the V max switch. <laughs> you know about the V max switch? I do, yeah. but, but, it, but tell it, us. Yeah. It's this guarded switch. It's on the, it's on the slope of the, of the cockpit outside the seat, obviously below the canopy. And it's, it has this red guard on it. And and we were supposed to we part of the uh, the uh, Foxbat intercept profile was to use it, <laughs> but it was it was safety wired closed so that so that we weren't using it all the time because it would generate such intense temperatures in the engine it would literally start melting the bearings mm. it would turn the engine into slag. Uh, and before it even did that, before it even did that, it, it because it would richen the fuel mixture to where it was maximum boost. You know, it's you know, uh, what's that? Uh, what's that? What's that British car show? Uh, top Gear. Uh, what's that? Top Gear. Yeah, Top Gear. Yeah, it's like Top Gear with no limits. You know, so so you had to break open this copper wire and. You know, they didn't put a tool in the airplane to do that with. So I don't know, you know, it, you could just really do it uh, by hand. But anyway, you flip the, the guard up after breaking the wire and you flip the switch. And that, that turns on, that turns the fuel control unit. Uh, it, it moves it to uh, to full rich. And you're in full blower already, full burn. Uh, and then the, the FTITs are just going, you know. It, but you're supposed to i don't care i got to get this kill mm. high priority target um and if you if you hit past 2.5 for very long the heating the airframe heating on the surface of the airplane would grow you know like you see those uh those uh artist enhanced uh, depictions of the sr71 going mach 3 plus where where the, all the leading edges are just glowing brightly, you know, well, that would start happening to the F-15, especially the, the highest drag component of the F-15 aerodynamically is the canopy, yeah. the windscreen and canopy. So it would, the heat would melt the windscreen and it would collapse in on the HUD. <laughs> and of course, you know, once it gave way, now you got 2.5 <laughs> Mach of air slamming you in the face right so nobody's going to do that once they saw it and, and i'd seen one airplane that actually had that happen really? and you know deforms it anyway so so yes again it was a uh, stipulated requirement by the air staff 
for Mac Air to make this airplane be able to do that. Was it useful? Huh. Maybe if you had that one fox bat that just had to be shot down before it made its recce run, yeah, it was probably worth sacrificing an F-15 to get it. But it was going to be a one-to-one -one kill ratio. You get him, and, and then and then your airplane's got to go to depot for a complete complete overhaul and makeover to be able to to be able to ever fly again. Your your two point two five then straight and level or or ramping down yeah, straight and level really? in the thirties somewhere. Uh, wow. Yeah. So so yeah. this is a, this is a good subject then to bring in the topic of what the book says versus what the airplane does. Um, and, and one of the things uh, based on again YouTube comments, so, so somebody had taken offence to your characterizations of your air combat against the Tomcat. Which, I don't really understand bad. because that's just your experience. That, you, it happened. Um, but anyway, yeah. one of the things they'd said is that, you know, the, the Tomcat had a turn advantage against the F-15 at low altitude. And um, and I just assume that that's because this person is referencing a, a diagram, a performance diagram in the NATOPS and a you know, performance diagram in the Dash 1 for the F-15. Um, did the aeroplane do what the book said it should do? And uh, And I guess the question I'm asking really is, for us non fighter pilots for for our, for those of us who are trying to compare and contrast um you know sincerely not um mm -hmm. not right. for the purposes of trying to prove somebody wrong or right. try to try to discredit somebody else but but people not well not me I don't do that kind of thing but there are people out there who are sincerely looking to understand where was one airplane stronger against the other can they look at those diagrams and be able to make that assessment are they mitigating factors that say that actually the diagram says this but the reality is different in, in my opinion and i've flown airplanes all my adult life all sorts of airplanes uh the, the diagrams um the performance uh, diagrams presented to us in our flight manuals uh, are engineering data uh they will not be the same as the actual performance you know, on a given day at a given location, you know, temperature, altitude, and all things considered. They're, uh, they're, really, uh, they're, really not, uh, they're really not the same thing. Uh, and the, uh, the performance diagrams to me are like uh, looking at the table of contents of a book. It's, it's just the basic information. Uh, you, 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 know, you, you open a book, you look at the table of contents, you see the title of the chapter, and, and you go read the chapter. And the chapter may relate to the chapter title some, in some offhanded way. But the chapter title doesn't tell you what happened in that chapter. Hmm. Uh, so, uh, so we we had to know. We did as pilots. We had to know what was in the performance uh, diagrams. Uh, we were queried. Uh, we took tests annually, uh, twice a year. Uh, once, uh, once for just basic flying, and the other was for tactical employment. And part of the standardization tests were to go into the to the Dash One's performance data, and to to the end, you know, the answer they were looking for was, "Tell me how fast, how far, how high you can go with this uh, this amount of payload, with this amount of fuel, and uh, and at this altitude or something like that." Uh, but but that's not how to fly the airplane. Uh, so so anyway so so uh, and and I say that for every airplane I've ever flown. It doesn't matter if it's you know a light airplane like I fly these days or an F fifteen or T thirty eight in training uh, or a, a commercial airliner. It performance data is from the engineers. Uh, the actual flying experience will not replicate those uh, exactly or precisely. It, it just won't. 
So you can get a sort of ballpark indication, but you wouldn't right. really want to sort of pick an argument with somebody and say, well, this oh, no. is what the book says, so therefore yeah. you're wrong. Okay. No. Not not at all. I would I would not argue the point uh with uh someone who is uh uh you know a tomcat uh, enthusiast and there, and there are many and I, and I don't mean to 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 take away from the enthusiasm various people have for various uh types of airplanes it's great it really is it's it's very encouraging and lively uh, so i wouldn't take anything away from from uh, their interest in the airplane that's their favorite that's great uh, but i sure would not argue performance comparisons based on technical or engineering data I mean, do, do you even know if the airplane's loaded with ordnance? Hmm. No. I guarantee you I can take a uh, an F-15 uh, clean, no fuel tanks, no ordnance, uh, uh, you know, half half fuel half internal fuel, and that particular page will outdo will out will show a performance advantage over every all the rest of the 1980s fighters in every at every altitude at every speed regime hmm. but but that's an air show performance <laughs> you know <laughs> no, slick no pylons no tanks no missiles half a tank of gas to keep from being heavy and yeah go put on an air show yeah. you know so anyway so so yeah that, that's uh that's com comparing charts to me is an invalid it, it it's a waste of time discussion to me okay yeah. well that's that's I'm, good to know i'm not yeah, sure I mean, that fully answered what, what was the rest of that question i'm not sure that fully answered well, that the question. was the question the, the, the question was can you trust the books i mean i i have been i was very lucky to have flown uh the eagle at eglin and um i fl i flew in a d model and the guy said to me, this thing struggles to go through the mark. Um, mm -hmm. We have to bunt it to get it to go through the yeah. mark. He said it's been over G'd so many times that it's bent. Ah, it's um, bent. It, it, yeah, it's it doesn't, it, it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't, doesn't do no. anything like. And so, and so I, I'd had this conversation before with somebody around, they were being abs absolute in their insistence that one airplane could outperform another because they had some charts and i'd said i'd made the point well actually there are other variables there are other factors are. how how well maintained is the airplane Do, are the engines pushing the thrust out that they're supposed to push enormously out? so the, the airplane that i went 2.25 mock with it had been out of the factory for probably less than six months hmm. it was brand spanking new of course this is it's going to give you all it's got it hasn't been bent yet the engines haven't been removed and replaced with older motors, you know, as they go through the overhaul cycle, you know, it, it because that's the ones we put on alert. We put our best performing airplanes on alert. It, it wasn't just, oh, it's that, it's, you know, it's 9080s turn to be on alert. No, no, we, we look, every squadron looked for the best performing airplanes to put on alert. So yeah, I flew a, an alert bird that was fresh out of the factory and that thing, did everything I wanted it to do. And so it probably performed to the the charts expectations. Yeah. But yes. there's but once but once the engines start wearing, they're, they're not as efficient. Uh, various things happen to the airframe. You get a little drag here, a little drag there from bit panels or or whatever. You start hanging more and more things on it uh, as far as external stores. Yeah, right. So, so yeah, that's uh, well, that, that does. I, I, I would, I would not. Uh, I would. That's. I'm being unkind. I would defer from having a discussion with someone else representing a different airplane over charts comparison. Yeah. Let's just go. Let's conclude with um, something that's a little lighter and perhaps more more humorous. So one oh, question. Boy. No pressure. The one question I've had um, was whether or not disco is your real call sign. Um, so maybe you could tell us. <laughs> you could tell us what's behind your call sign, and um, and I if can. if you, if you have any other call signs from other people that you wanted to tell the story of, um, 
uh, then maybe that's how we <laughs> will wrap up today. Uh, well, yes, I, I, I come by my call sign disco, honestly. I truly do. Let me. And as my lovely wife, Jan, will be glad to tell you, it's not because I can dance. <laughs> but the, t the times in which I became a fighter pilot was the uh, disco mania with Saturday Night Fever being the, uh, you know, the, the movie, or one of them at the time, during the disco fever. Okay. But that's just, that is actually just the out. That's not really the, the reason. That's just the out. Because when I arrived at, at Bitbird, my name was uh, unchanged. It was still Douglas Dildy, which is uh, an ancient, ancient Scottish name, <laughs> as, it, as, it, as it happens. But we don't need to go into all that. Uh, but it's also very close, very, very close to the, uh, the proper name for a marital aid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so for a while I was known as the walking marital aid. <laughs> uh, so, so, so I got, I arrived at, uh, you know, in, in training command, we didn't have call signs. Uh, call signs came from Vietnam. That's another, uh, another one of the legacies of Vietnam, and, and a very rich one, I might add. Uh, so, uh, so, so while they were very popular, quote on the front lines, and that is to say, Yusefi and Pakaf, right? They're very popular there because uh, the use of tactical call signs came about because the assigned call signs were so long and cumbersome they were they were they were just not operable in a tactical environment um, for instance um, the uh, the assigned call signs for uh, f-15s at Bitburg were uh, alpha lima so then you had a two-digit number right so if you were the seventh four ship to launch, you were Alpha Lima 71727374. Well, it's really, really hard to get Alpha Lima 74 break right out before the missile, before the ATOL missile impacts the your wingman, right? So in combat, those were those were trashed by in Southeast Asia for a simple call sign that was the nickname uh, of the pilot so instead of saying alpha lima seven four break right it was disco break right much more concise so the the uh the unwritten uh, rule about tech call signs was two syllables distinctive and represented the individual in the cockpit so that you didn't have to think about who was seven four mm -hmm. you knew that Disco was seven four, right? And you, from the briefing, the lineup card, and all that. Uh, and we flew together as paired elements. You know, I always flew. I almost say always. I almost always flew with uh, an academy classmate of mine who had been an F four uh, pilot at Ramstein. He came to Bitburg as one of our senior uh, fighter pilots. Uh, Steve Randolph. His call sign is Log. Uh, the only reason is because he slept like one and he got that name being on alert because even the klaxon could not wake him up. You know, his, his, his gib, his uh, whistle would have to have to roll him out of bed to, to, to slide down the fireman's pole to launch on a night sortie. So, so anyway, so, so, uh, so I flew with log a lot. The, um, uh, and uh, and so that and log single syllable, easy to remember, you know. And log break left or log uh, 
you know, come come left, you know, band at 12 o'clock uh, low or something like that. Very, it, it enhances very concise uh, verbal communication. And you've already pointed out in these podcasts that, that the F-15 is very communications dependent. So the transmissions had to be short and informative, full of information, but not but not take up a lot of a lot of airtime. Uh, so uh, so I, I get to Bitburg. Uh, there's uh, basically three ways you get a tactical call sign. Uh, one is you do this called buffoonery. You do something stupid. Uh, for instance, we had a guy on his check ride from his from his mission ready check uh, check ride, and he had flown F fours at Spain Dom and came across to Bitburg, and and. At the end of the mission, they, they come into the pattern, they come do a low approach and instrument approach uh, to, to check that off. Okay, he's good, he's good flying instruments in the weather in Germany, and then pitch up to landing. And so he's got his pen or pencil in his left hand because he was left handed. And then, uh, and he did, had to write down frequencies and headings and all that on his, on his card, on his knee board. So on downwind, after pitching up for landing, then he goes to lower the gear. Well, the pencil in his hand goes into the jettison button hole when he when he when he goes up there to lower the gear because it's right above the gear handle, right? And he promptly, promptly, <laughs> he promptly shits the centerline fuel tank, <laughs> and it falls into the fuel uh, storage area. And so the joke was, well, he, at least he returned it from you know from where it came from. But his call sign became tank, right? So if you show buffoonery during your training, the other ones, uh, if you look like somebody, like uh, there's a there's a fighter pilot that you and I know very well, uh, and Clouseau, right? Because he looks like Inspector Clouseau from the Pink Panther movies, right? We both know him. And there's others that are, because they got pointed ears, they're Yoda or, or something like that. Uh, and then, and then the third one is, if they can't come up with anything else, then maybe they pick on your name. And so, you know, so here I am, Dildy, and immediately the the squadron glommed on to Dildo, right? <laughs> okay, fine. Yeah, yeah, I'd heard it before. It's not, it's not a new joke. Ha ha ha. Well, at this time, the uh, the uh, this this tactical call sign thing was really hot because two F4s had gone to Westup in Florida. And instead of, sh instead of shooting down the uh the F-102 drone, one of them shot down the other. <laughs> <laughs> and since and since and since this 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 disaster and these two guys these two f4s were from ramstein so since since this happened on tac turf tactical air command turf then then of course tac convened the, the accident board right they fished the two guys out of the water bring and you know they're, they're going what happened what happened <laughs> Fish the two guys out of the water interrogate them the airplane just blew up <laughs> And uh, found out that the other guys had shot him down uh, it, with a name nine. Well, the TAC the Accident Investigation Board wrote that off to confusion called by caused by the uh, the uh, liberal use of tactical call signs. Now, okay. That that Lima Alpha Zero One shot down Lima Alpha Zero Two. Why? Because the 102 drone didn't have a call sign, <laughs> you know. So anyway, so TAC went went and blamed it on TAC call signs. So it was really hot because TAC was supposed to be the leaders of the TAF, the Tactical Air Forces, and they were trying to impose and you know, throw their weight around. I mean, they're not even on the front lines, you know. They're at home. You know, going to Walmart every day, and we're and we're dealing with the Bitburg BX. You know, <laughs> but but yet they want to tell us how to fight a war, right? So anyway, 
So they were, they wanted to make this big statement against against your safety that you guys need to get rid of the tactical call size. You know, we're, we're losing airplanes because of them. <laughs> so so the uh, the the safety do his name was Smotherman. I don't remember what his call sign was, uh, but it was probably pretty good. Uh, it's probably you know named after some serial killer you know, who would smother its victims. But anyway. Uh, so the, uh, so the, uh, smothering, well, he flew with Bedberg. And so he's up in the air, you know, flying, he flew with the 525, the Bulldogs. And the Bulldogs had this little chant that they would, every, anytime they would go to a, the bar, the club, or any other club, if they're like, let's, let's say the Ramstein Club, where, you know, there were a lot of fighter pilots going there just on staff jobs and stuff. So the, the Bulldogs had this thing of, of walking into a club and announcing, are there any other bulldogs in the in the house? And the answer was always, you bet your sweet ass there is. Well, that, that's fine in a bar setting. So this uh, this uh, air traffic controller, Bitberg, it was called the Eiffel, the control both Bitberg and Spangler. This Eiffel air traffic controller, you know, takes the headset from his from the the offgoing uh, controller sits down and just announces are there any bulldogs in the air and all of the f-15s being flown by the 525 that were born at that time you bet your sweet ass there is 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 and smotherman heard all this <laughs> and he thought that oh man <clears throat> that is a breach of air discipline we can't have that and so he sent this reprimand down to, to General Luke or Colonel Lucas. He, Colonel Lucas was our, our uh, deputy for operation. Two MiG kills in Vietnam. Ultimate respect for that fighter pilot. And so so he gets this, he gets this letter from Smotherman saying, saying, you gotta, you gotta knock this shit off. You can't, you know, that's breaches of discipline. We can't have that. We can't have that. Because you, you know, because the because Langley's breathing down my my throat about about uh, the lack of discipline of you safety aviators. Well, the next, what do you think the next page in his in basket is? It's the squadron request to name me dildo. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so General Lucas goes, oh man, I I, I can't afford this. That that that's no. send it back to the squadron. Said, I'm sorry, you guys got to change it. Come up with something else. So that so of course you know the the NATO Tigers being uh, being you know college educated guys they just go let's change two letters in his name <laughs> from dildo to disco and yeah and, and save ourselves a lot of work and so that's how I got it, it it's a uh, one of those uh, inglorious kind of stories but it is true. It is true. And I've never been known by anything else. Although there is one time that I almost got, had my, uh, my uh, call sign changed uh, because we got scrambled out of Schusterberg on, oh, it was, it was in the winter. So it was, I think it was, it might've been New Year's Day to investigate. This was after the wall had fallen and and West Germans were flying over the wall and, and picking up people. They, they were flying Cessnas into East Germany, picking up people and bringing them out to the West wow. because things had, had, had come unraveled and the, the East Germans and the, neither the East Germans nor the Soviets were enforcing anything. And so there was a Cessna that came back across the wall uh, and we were sent to investigate. Well... At Schusterberg, sometimes the uh, the officer of the day would uh, coordinate with uh, with the Dutch military uh, uh, air defense command for a a, uh, a practice scramble. But it'd be one of those where where when uh, after you started engines and you got the INS online and you were ready to go, then they would cancel the launch. They wouldn't launch you. And so that that had happened during my tour there. That had happened a couple of times, and no big deal. It was just a test of readiness to be sure that we weren't, you know, sleeping or, 
or um, they're just not re ready. And so the the klaxon sounded, and I didn't I didn't even bother putting my boots on because I felt for sure we were going to get canceled <laughs> before they pulled the chocks. So I go running up running up the ladder in my stocking feet, <laughs> plop down in the in the you know in the cockpit, fire up the JFS, and the crew chief buckles me in and and clears out. And, and sure enough, we got words. We this is an alpha scramble. This is it's not a training. It's not a tango. It's not a it's not a tango scramble. It's not training. It's an alpha scramble to the very edge of the IGB, the inner German border, to investigate this slow mover. Okay, and so so I flew the whole sword in my stocking feet. So the squadron wanted to change my name to Boots, but it 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 never it never really flew. Do, do so. you think do you think you could have um, sort of gone through life with the call sign dildo? So, so uh, that that really is a deterrent to dating. You know that. <laughs> as long as I remained happily married, it would have been okay. But I, I've noticed I've noticed a lot of wives. Well, I, every wife I know doesn't refer to their husband by their tactical call sign. And and uh, did Annie call you Disco? She didn't. She called no, you no. Doug, and, oh, and Jan no. Jan calls you Doug. Yeah, you know. So so. But but I guess sort of you know in in public settings, the sort of the the less acceptable um, call signs might be those that you would be sort of more reluctant to to share. Yeah, I mean, is is that is that a thing? <laughs> I mean, is it... yeah, that's true. That that that's true. So it's a good thing. I mean, that would be one that uh, probably after a couple of years after I established my reputation as a fighter pilot, I probably would have sought to change that. Yeah. Maybe and rarely did it occur during an assignment, but when you moved to a new base, because you had to go through the naming ceremony all over again. Did you? Oh yeah. Ah, okay. But if you were previously named, it's like the movie Animal House. You know, you were named Flounder because you have two eyes on one side of your head or something. Uh, so uh, or otter or whatever. So, so I probably would have sought on a subsequent assignment to to change. But if I never went back to the Eagle, you know, if I went back to to training as an IP in T thirty eight, then I, I would never mention what my call sign had been hmm. in Europe. Yeah. So. Okay. Well. But but yeah, the the, the there are certain guys who. Uh, whose tactical call signs, even though they may not be dirty, if you will, they're still not that good. Like there was a guy whose last name was Lester and his call signs, Mo, Mo Lester. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, not, not cool. You know, not PC. Eh, I'd stay away from that one. Okay, Disco, thanks for uh, joining us once more on, on the channel for episode four. It's been a delight talking to you again, and uh, I'm looking forward to Thank you, Steve. seeing Always you again. Always a pleasure. Part five, we're going to do the 2v2, the 4v4, 4vx, and then um, we'll talk about um, To Defeat the Few, which is your fantastic book, which I referenced right at the beginning, um, and will hopefully culminate in bringing together all this knowledge and, and how it can be applied to an air power campaign and analysis, which is ultimately what you did for the, the book. So well, we'll see you for episode five. Looking forward to it, as always, Steve.